Tums. It's probably sitting in your cabinet right now. As an over-the-counter drug, how deadly could it be? Is it even possible to overdose on this stuff? Daniel, a 31-year-old man with a history of alcoholism, has been taking Tums every single day of his life for the past five years. Because of alcohol, he suffers from severe acid reflux and has learned to remedy it by chewing on Tums with each swig. Sometimes he'll take more than 24 tablets a day. One day, after a long night of drinking, Daniel wakes up in a cold sweat, feeling anxious and visibly confused. This is not the first time he's worried his family. For three months, he's been ignoring his increasing clumsiness and persistent dizziness. Even in his half-lucid state, he sees the writing on the wall and calls 911. In the ER, Daniel begins to seize. The ER doc rushes in and orders the assembled team to inject 10 milligrams of midazolam into his thigh. As they wait for the medication's effects, the doc notices Daniel's bloodshot eyes for the first time. He sees substance abusers with red eyes every day. Smelling the alcohol on Daniel's breath, he thinks no more of it. Unfortunately for Daniel, the red eyes are not from drug abuse, but actually signs of kidney failure. This sign is known as conjunctival hyperemia and is an uncommon sign of kidney damage caused by hypercalcemia or high blood levels of calcium. The calcium salts normally excreted by the kidneys are unable to filter out and deposit in the conjunctival and corneal tissues of the eye, causing a local inflammatory reaction. Further blood work confirms the startling realization Daniel's blood calcium levels are sky high. Furthermore, his blood is severely alkalotic in what is known as metabolic alkalosis, that is, filled with base, the opposite of acid. Daniel is suffering from acute kidney failure due to high blood values of creatinine, a value typically low in the blood as this molecule should be easily filtered out by the kidneys when they are working. The doctor realizes Daniel's seizures are likely from the hypercalcemia, but find the metabolic alkalosis in the kidney damage to be curious anomalies he was not expecting. Daniel is admitted to the hospital for further management. Because he is very dehydrated, several bags of intravenous normal saline is given, which should also treat his hypercalcemia. Within 24 hours, Daniel does begin to feel better, but strangely, repeat blood samples continue to reveal sky-high calcium levels, despite the medical treatment. It is at this point that the doctors get suspicious and search Daniel's room. In doing so, they discover several tablets of calcium carbonate sitting on the man's bedside dresser. Calcium carbonate is the active ingredient of Tums, a common antacid. Daniel tells the doctor his habit of taking multiple tablets of Tums every single day, something he continued even while being hospitalized. He didn't think it was a big deal after all. Tums are basically candies, no? There are literal fruits on the picture, Daniel protests. Of course, this was the smoking gun the doctors were looking for. Daniel was overdosing on Tums, the culprit for his current presentation. This fully explains the abnormal blood values and why he's been feeling so terrible for the past several months. Daniel has what doctors call milk alkali syndrome, a triad of hypercalcemia, alkalosis, and renal impairment, resulting from the ingestion of too much calcium and absorbable alkali, which in this case came in the form of calcium carbonate, the active ingredient of Tums. In this syndrome, a self-perpetuating environment in the kidney is created in which the calcium and alkali limit the elimination of each other in the urine. The excess calcium damages the kidney and can cause increased urination, which leads to dehydration, further exacerbating the situation and preventing even more calcium and alkali from being properly filtered out by the kidneys. And thus, a vicious cycle is created until the patient devolves into a state of confusion and seizures, sometimes even becoming comatose. Patients can also develop painful kidney stones, inflammation of the pancreas, heart arrhythmias, anorexia, severe constipation, and muscle weakness. Unfortunately, it is understandable why Daniel resorted to Tums, for without it, he would have suffered from terrible gastritis, likely due to alcohol. Over time, the stomach acid would have inflamed the stomach lining further, and possibly even developed into painful peptic ulcers. This can feel like a constant burning pain in the epigastric region. Delay treatment even longer, and you allow the acid to burn a hole in your stomach. This is called a perforated ulcer and is now life-threatening. Luckily, there are treatments in existence today like omeprazole, pantoprazole, and famotidine that specifically suppress the production of acid in the stomach. These medicines work differently than Tums, which is again an alkalotic substance that simply neutralizes stomach acid, but does nothing to stop its production. If you were a patient with acid reflux back in the day, you'd probably find yourself being treated by the Sippy Regimen, invented by Dr. Bertram Sippy. He recommended hourly feedings of milk and egg puree from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
daily, while at night, regular intervals of stomach pumping. The thought was, if there was too much acid in the stomach, sucking out the gastric contents at regular intervals would be the obvious treatment. In between mouthfuls of egg and milk puree, patients are instructed to take sippy powder, a mixture of calcium and baking soda, every half an hour for six times total. If this regimen was too intense, the alternative was to get three weeks of simple, continuous milk drips. But to accomplish this, you'd need a nasogastric tube for the milk to get continuously dripped through. In this procedure, a plastic tube is inserted so deeply into your nose that it is forcibly jammed down the back of your throat and traverses all the way into your stomach. If that sounds awful, you'd be right. According to many articles, nasogastric insertion is one of the most painful procedures that can be done. Though many did get better as a result of this regimen, critics believe this was simply because they were literally straight up chilling for three continuous weeks on milk drips. Others credited the charm of the nursing staff or the Freudian benefits of the acquisition of milk. If you don't have three weeks to spare, the only other option in the 19th century was to get a gastrectomy aka surgically remove your stomach, first successfully done by Dr. Theodore Bill Roth in 1881, or the vagotomy, a procedure in which the vagus, a nerve supplying the stomach, critical in the production of stomach acid, is severed. While damaging this nerve does reduce the amount of acid produced, it also results in significant delay in the emptying of the stomach. This delay was so bad that the doctor noted that a second surgery often had to be done to properly drain the stomach. Yeah, like I said, we've come a long way. So, if you ever have bad acid reflux, don't rely on Tums and don't surgically remove your stomach. You have other options. Consider switching to a longer acting medicine like a Meprazole and contact a gastrointestinal specialist to get to the root cause of the issue. If you like today's story, please consider subscribing. This entire channel is dedicated to health literacy through the telling of interesting stories. Until next time, my friends, stay humble, stay healthy, stay fresh. Peace.